uh, Dan Dietrich, who's our normal magician of the buttons, is not with us today. And that's why there's no background music. So if you've been saying to yourself, hey, what happened to all the music? Well, uh, it's in Dan's secret little hidden place in his, in his side of it over in South Bend, Indiana. But I'm Doug Padgett in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and joined by my rabbi, maybe your rabbi, maybe rabbi for all of us, rabbi for the people, Joseph Edelheit. And uh, we're going to be talking about the impact of social, of Christian nationalism, our social construct, what we're up to. And, and Rabbi Joseph is in Rio de Janeiro because, you know, just, you're just the most interesting person we all know. So of course you're, of course you're, you're in Rio, Uh, but it's been a rabbi in, in uh, the great state of Minnesota was a rabbi here for a long time and serves a lot of functions, professor, a rabbi, a doctor, and, uh, and uh, my, my guiding light to all things um, of deep spiritual understanding and all. So, Rabbi Joseph, good to see you. Good to see you, Doug. Glad you're back. Safe. Thank, thank you. Yeah, I was off this weekend over at the in western New York at the Reawaken America tour events, running a counter-messaging press conference, and then spent a little time uh, wandering around the facility there and talking to the the people of uh, uh, of this of this event. And Rabbi Joseph, I'll tell you, it was um, it was not a pleasant not a pleasant event. Partly because I just disagreed with so much of the content and feel find it to be so dangerous. Um, but the people there didn't seem to be of particularly good good spirits either. So it was just a, it's just a tough time. Um, uh, oftentimes, when I as mentioned to you earlier, when I go to these conservative situations, CPAC or the NRA events or this kind of thing, um, the vibe in the space and with people is uh, beleaguered. Is is the word that kept coming to my mind? That these um, these situations are full of people who just feel really bad about the world, and you can kind of feel it in the air. And so, anyway, that's that's at least my interpretation. And and my conversation with people, they would say that too, you know. If you were to do one of those polls, you know, that people often do, where they'll ask uh, what, uh, you know, uh, do you think we're on the right track or wrong track? These people are like, oh, we are on the wrong track, and it is going to, you know, it's going down downhill fast. So, uh, But, Rabbi, we always start with the weather. In Minnesota, you will know these beautiful summer days, again, just you know, 81 degrees, low humidity. It's a, uh, it's a winter. How are things in Rio? 78 degrees outside. I'm 150 yards from the beach in Rio, Le Blanc, fabulous area. And, uh, I've been inside doing some work, getting ready for this conversation. But when we're done, I'm taking my walk on the beach for you, Doug. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Uh, think of me when you're strolling along the beach in, in Rio, a place that I've yet to visit. So I'd love, love to do that. All right. Well, uh, Joseph, even though the weather's beautiful, the beach is the way that it should be, at least for now in Rio, uh, things in our country are really in, in tough, tough situations. And we, I really appreciate your reach out last week. We are, we've put out this curriculum to help people understand Christian nationalism and to engage it in their, in their own communities. And, uh, you had a good point that one of the things that we are missing in our work uh, on this is what is the impact on Jewish communities? What's an impact on Jewish culture? And what's an impact, therefore, on the whole United States by this, by this Christian nationalism? And I'm uh, reminded now that we are just days after the five-year anniversary of the Unite the Right rally, which felt to me like a coming-out party for the anti-Jewish and, and neo-Nazi expression that we all heard and saw when people were chanting, you will not replace us, wearing shirts that said six million are not enough, and referencing a uh, Holocaust narrative as what they saw as a positive narrative uh, in the world and wanted to see come back. And it was a tragic day in, in our country. And it hasn't gone away. It has uh, reformed itself and popping up in all these places. So um, thank, thanks for talking Five about all these things today. Um, uh, what could have been, and and in my view should have been, a once and for all opportunity for the then new president, uh, Donald Trump, to make it clear that he was not playing to the worst possible base. Hmm. And you'll remember after the horror of Charlottesville, in which a a human being was killed when a protester, one of the 
dangerous fascist mm-hmm. racist protesters rammed his car into a crowd mm-hmm. literally running over people you'll remember then president trump said well there are fine people on both sides yeah wow and i gotta tell you uh no actually there are not fine people on both sides yeah i i'm a radical pluralist one of the best things I've ever done in my life was to have been the resident rabbi at the porch, your religious community. There are lots of things I will include in my pluralism, but no, yep. that group of people are not fine people. That's right. So five years ago, we somehow there was another trap door that opened and he didn't fall into it. Yeah. So five years on from this, uh, Joseph, what is your reflection on why the country didn't demand more strongly of the press? Now there were condemnations. We did a, you did a, pe- people came out and yelled, but it, Short of just, okay, this man is sort of politically Teflon in, in his horribleness. He's only made Teflon not because he's special, that these things don't stick to him. It's because people don't allow it to stick to him. What, what is your sense about why the country wasn't more in horror about the clear anti-Semitic narratives that came out of, out of that particular day, but that entire movement that that was alive and well then and is now. Anti-Semitism has been a part of America since the first 23 Jews landed Hmm. in New Amsterdam. First 23 Jews came from Recife, Brazil, running away from the Portuguese Inquisition, landed in a, a place called New Amsterdam, where Peter Stuyvesant was the governor. Hmm. Peter Stuyvesant thought Jews were disgusting. They had rejected our Lord Jesus and wouldn't let them in. Wow. The Dutch West Indies Company said, uh-uh, no, no, we, there are Jews back here that own stock in the Dutch West Indies Company. No, you can let them. And he let them in, but took everything they owned and so they got off the boat with nothing first 23 jews who landed in america north america 1654. look um i i don't need to remind everyone we go back leo frank in 1913 uh indicted on killing a 13 year old uh convicted the KKK and the uh, governor of Georgia uh, let him be captured and he was lynched. The 20s, Henry Ford, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, printed over three years in a newspaper he bought, the Dearborn Independent, for that reason. Hmm. Father Coughlin and his Catholic populism in the 30s this is not new, yeah. but we've learned to control it. And we had hoped, we had hoped that here was a president whose daughter had chosen to become a Jew to marry Kushner, his son-in-law, yeah. and converted according to the tenets of Orthodox Judaism. Hmm. Uh, okay. You would hope if you have a daughter who's a Jew, grandchildren being raised as Jews, you would understand that people walking with fire torches the way the Nazis did. Yeah. Screaming, Jews will not replace us. Based on a theory, a replacement theory, that is what the manifesto of the Buffalo top shooter. Yeah that there is a white genocide. You know, what, you know what are we still doing this? I know yeah. that's see that that's what strikes me. Like I know it's not new. And we've had to talk about this for the 15 years we've known each other. I know it's not new, but I actually thought it was old. Like I wanted to believe 
that we had come to a place in this country where bigotry against Jews was not something people would tolerate, nor would people want to be exposing, want to be pushing out. And frankly, I was surprised five years ago at how clear it was. And I'm surprised today how clear in the Christian nationalist movements this anti-Semitic thing is. And one of the questions I wanted to to ask you about is, you know, we we all know that there's this connection between Christian nationalism and the rise of Christian nationalism and anti-Semitism. But people don't often pick it out because they think that many times these, these folks that they hear who we would identify, I think should identify as Christian nationalists, also are very pro-Israel. And they wanted the temple move, or the they they wanted the uh, the capital of Israel moved to Jerusalem, and they're always pushing trips to to the Holy Lands, like they're Zionists in this strange way. But then their Christian nationalism also has this uh, approach that that feels like it's anti-Semitic, and that's really confusing to people. Can you help us understand how it is I, I, that the I won't misuse the fact that someone has abused your name and the guy is running for governor in in Pennsylvania. Uh, He's a Christian nationalist who um, I sent you an article from the Jewish Forward today. Um, He is using someone wearing a Jewish parasol, a talit, blowing a shofar. Yes. I mean, calling the the misappropriation of my symbols and this guy is running for the governor of the city in which four years ago 11 jews were murdered in a massacre at yeah. tree of life synagogue in the, pittsburgh the audacity yeah. how how is it possible that he could move up to the threshold of being potentially a governor he denies the legitimacy of the election he is absolutely not just an anti-semite he's a dangerous anti-semite who believes in the kind of christian certainty that he wants america to be christian period and if you aren't a christian well you can live here but you can't yeah. live here according to the standards of what he and many others now want. Uh, the anti-Semitism that you and I have spoken of and I've taught about when you were pastor at Solomon's Porch, that anti-Semitism has been subdued mm-hmm. into a new Christian identity. Yeah. Anti-Semitism in which I am a Christian so fully that everyone around me must be a Christian. And if they aren't, then they will live as I see fit. Dobbs has established a religious theological standard Mm -hmm. that excludes the vast majority of people living in North America. Yeah. United States. Jewish law says a life in utero at any point is only a life in potentia. In birthing, Mm -hmm. even the most strict traditional Orthodox Jews do not accept life of the fetus. Mm -hmm. It's a potential life. Okay. Let's live in a pluralism in which those who wish to say conception is life never, ever have to have the termination of a pregnancy, ever. But you're now going to make me live by your religious standards? Yeah. So Christian identity, which fuels Christian nationalism, is not just the the old anti-Semitism, it's the new anti-Semitism of erasure. So when you put on a talit, a prayer shawl, you blow a shofar, you have misappropriated my ritual objects. You've erased me. 
Yeah. Well, and so people know how clear this is. When I was at this event that I mentioned to you in, in Rochester, New York, and it was a event at a church and outside in a tent, a big, you know, outdoor tent, the person speaking on the stage, when I first walked in, and I posted a video with this, if somebody wants to hear it, he was a, going on a, a long rant about how people have misunderstood what was going on January 6th at the insurrection, right? So what he was trying to say was, there were a whole lot of us who were there who weren't a part of attacking the, the Capitol, and why are people conflating the groups, right? Which... Side note, the reason we're conflating the groups is because you refuse to separate yourself from the group, right? You refuse to say that was wrong. Those people who were part of our groups that attacked the Capitol in our name did something wrong. They won't come out and say that. That's one of the biggest reasons. But the way he described the group that was there, he said, we're a bunch of peaceful, praying, shofar-blowing charismatics. Because for people who don't know, in the charismatic Pentecostal movement, they've taken on this idea of being like completed Jews, so they uh, use all of the features, the shofar, the prayer shawl, and the commitment to Israel. And this is what I mean, Joseph, that confuses people. When we were there and we were talking to folks about how uh, Hagee, at Hagee's church where they held the same event, they were talking about all kinds of anti-Semitic stuff, and people were like, well, this preacher, Hagee in Texas, he can't be, and these people at these events, they can't be anti-Jewish. They like blow shofars and they wear prayer shawls and all of this. So people, I think, get confused because they don't know how it can be that people are pro-Israel, pro-shofar blowing, always quoting the Old Testament. How can those people be anti-Semitic? Can you help people because to understand how that be, can exist together? They, they want to appropriate Jewish life in order to bring the second coming. You're valuable as a Jew. We will uh, engage in pro-Israel, the strongest right wing support of Zionism, because we need it. We need it as the staging of his coming back. Hmm. Hmm. So they aren't sensitive to the pluralism of living Jews yeah. and Jewish life. They aren't supportive of the ongoing existence, unique and separate existence of Jews and Jewish life. They see me as the necessary in the way bridge mm -hmm. between the certainty of their dispensationalism. So Edelheit, I'm taking your talit, your shofar, the land where you need to go in case there's more anti-Semitism, because at some point, you stupid fool, you didn't convert, he's going to come and you're going to be damned. Mm -hmm. Hagee, uh, the Jews for Jesus, Messianic Jews, these are not people who believe I should still be here. Mm-hmm. They want me to convert. If I don't convert, they're certainly going to make Christian identity the focus of the life in which I have to now live. I see. Yep. So, so I, I feel like this is. Nature. I feel like this is really an important piece that you're bringing up. That, um, and, and you know, I know some people get sensitive about micro, you know, what are often called micro uh, uh, offenses and so on. Like, there's people f often feel that there's very little they can do or say that doesn't have someone critiquing them and telling them that you've said it wrong and you've mentioned the wrong thing and you have you didn't even know how offensive you were in all of this. One of the people wearing a shirt at this event, it was at just simply said, stop being offended by everything, right? So this this kind of notion, I know that exists in the world that people, people feel that. So I'm not trying to sort of point out that... Uh, that these Christians are just offensive without knowing it. There's something more going on, which I think is important of what you're bringing up here, which is it's the use of Jewish life and culture and religion only as a precursor to the thing that they believe that's the real thing. And that it is Correct. only valuable as a transitional 
uh, narrative. Talk about how that feels for you and other Jews living in America to hear this kind of push of a Christian nation that's going to honor Jews for their contribution, but they really mean it that way. Like it's only a contribution to something that's that's now better for the rest of us. Let's do data first. 1939, 16.6 million Jews in the world in a global population of a little over 2 billion. Hmm. 2022, 15.8 million Jews in a global population hmm. of 7.9 billion. Wow. So let's begin with Excuse me, how many of us are there? Yeah. And you now want to, without asking our permission, after we've told you, please don't do this, not because it's a trigger aggression, but because it's, excuse me, rude, really, really rude to use... <coughs> that which you are not ritually commanded to do. Yeah. Do you want to sit down and read Paul together? Paul said, what comes out of your mouth is more important than what goes in your mouth. So Paul said, you don't have to keep kosher. So you're going to take my prayer shawl, which is commanded in the book of Deuteronomy. And you don't know what hmm. the fringes on the perch all mean, but you see that Jews wear it. So mm -hmm. let's be authentically Jewish, hmm. like Jesus was. Hmm. It, excuse me, could you ask, ask an authentic Jew how he feels? Yeah. So the Messianic Jewish community, the Hagi Jewish community, the community of the Christian nationalists have acquired my rituals. They don't care about my survival. Hmm. They don't care about the survival of 6.3 million Jews in the United States. Mm -hmm. They care about the necessity of Israel's survival as it pertains to the prophecies of the second coming. Yeah. Yeah, it really is a narrative of the future of the world, right? In the for a lot of these these people and the, those who are not familiar with the subset of Christians for whom Christian nationalism is the default. Cuz it's not the default for all Christians, but there is a set of them, especially evangelical charismatic Pentecostals and some Catholics for whom the beginning and end of their thinking of their religious identity and their national identity are the same. They have the same beginning. They have the same end. They're just like they're, they're, they're part and parcel for that group. So often, and this is why you'll always hear them talking about end times, future end of the world narratives, because that is the frame by which everything happens. And Jerusalem to these people is the place where this is all going to go down. So therefore, you have to keep the Jews part of the story until you can establish what's going on. And that's why so many Christians who continue to support Trump, Christians from this, especially the charismatic Pentecostal traditions, support Trump, because when he moved the capital of, of or the, the embassy of the United States, to Jerusalem, they saw that as signs that this was part of the bringing about the, the end of the world and the establishment of the reign of Christ on earth, of which the United States laws and actions are also a part of. So when you listen carefully to these folks, what they're saying is, we want to bring about what's often called an eschatology or an end of this age to the next age by the laws that we pass, by our relationship with Israel, and by the actions that we do. So what they're trying to do is to bring about a, a reign of God on earth through the function of the United States. That is the essence 
of Christian nationalism and really is, is an abuse to the, to, to the Jewish narrative? Well, it's not just an abuse to the Jewish narrative. It's an abuse to the plurality of Christianity mm. with whom I've worked for 50 years as a rabbi. Yeah. Yeah, we, we should mention the doctorate. So, of when I said that you're also a doctor, tell the good people what you happen to have a doctorate in. I did my doctoral work at the Divinity School of the University of Chicago in Christian theology. <laughs> and uh, the Rabbi with... of my career is that the Divinity School recognized me last year as the Distinguished Alumnus of the Year. First rabbi to be acknowledged by uh, that school. Look, um, <clears throat> the work you're doing is prophetic. And more important than if I were to continue to do it, it's important because you're making a statement as an evangelical. This is in opposition to interfaith dialogue. Yeah. These people will not be in dialogue with me. There's nothing to dialogue about. Yeah, that's right. They're not interested in my approaching them as I once did to you. Gee, do you understand that when you invite people to the Lord's table. And when you say, and on the night he was betrayed. And we did a whole dialogue sermon yeah. on that. Yeah. And then I said, thank you very much for explaining it. And you know, I will never share from the table. People say, but why? We're inviting you. Because it's the Lord's table. It is an act of sacred, public, shared Christian commitment. Oh, so pluralism requires respect of yeah. boundaries. Yeah. These people don't respect my boundaries. Oh, that, they don't respect your boundaries either, by the way. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, okay, so... So much of the, you also sent this this fabulous article that the anti-Semitism of the Christian nationalists um, is thanks to QAnon. Can you talk a bit about all of what has gone on and this this image that was at the insurrection is so classic. It has a Trump for those just listening on the podcast. It's an image of the, a Trump flag, um, and then below it has this very familiar flag that says Jesus is my Savior and Trump is my President with an American flag in the middle of it. And it really is the great Christian nationalist ex expression of our day. Um, something new is up, and whatever QAnon was in the past and now has become part of Stop the Steal and anti-vaccination movements around the COVID virus and all this, it is, the, it is the delivery system for a whole lot of people who think that they're just following Christianity and maybe a libertarian streak of Christianity, but they're actually finding themselves into uh, anti-Semitism. Can, can you share a bit about that? Uh, one of the ways you define anti-Semitism as the oldest conspiracy theory. It's a magnet for con conspiracy wow. theory. One of the oldest conspiracy theory uh, began uh, with the idea that Jews would take Christian children, slaughter them for mm -hmm. the use of their blood, in the making of matzah, the unleavened bread for the Passover. This, of course, is a uh, uh, way of manipulating the charge that Jews killed Jesus, were responsible for the deicide, the death of God. I believe during medieval times that Jews would steal a host, hmm. nail it onto the wall, and the host would bleed, which of course makes sense because the host consecrated is the body of the Christ. Well, what is the host most like? Piece of matzah, unleavened bread. Well, if there's blood in the host, there must be blood in the matzah. You're following the critical logic here, aren't you? <laughs> so there must be blood in the matzah. Hmm. Where did they get that? They take Christian children, kidnap them, and fatten them up for the use of making matzah. Mm. You get a 
conflation of Grimm and, uh, you know, Hansel and Gretel, the stealing of children, the use of the children. Now you have uh, the idea of pedophiles and a global conspiracy. Uh, Jews have always been that global conspiracy. So you have a new attempt conspiracies, which have always been carriers of anti-Semitism. Look, um, the United States is blessed to have Deborah Lipstadt, Dr. Deborah Lipstadt, as a global envoy, U.S. ambassador on all matters of anti-Semitism. Uh, her book, Anti-Semitism, Here and Now, is very important hmm. and deals with the idea of a conspiracy theory as the primary vehicle for the <coughs> continued belief of Jews destroying life. And that's how you get QAnon Hmm. And Christian nationalists using QAnon as a continued vehicle on social media. Uh, I am so afraid of the number of people who have already been elected in primaries. Yeah. How, how did this guy in Pennsylvania? get to be a Republican candidate. Yeah, yeah, right. How, why how why are the Republicans happen? picking these guys? Yep. Right. So you, you now have APAC, one of the most significant pro-Israel support and now funding organizations, backing people who deny the legitimacy of the election, even though they might be Christian nationalists. Yeah. What, what have we done that somehow, as you noted before, let's look for the Christian community that supports the state of Israel. Well, it's 12 years of Benjamin Netanyahu. Yeah. Saw so a, a bottomless pit of funding and the loudest possible voices, not, not reform rabbis like me, <laughs> <laughs> not not people who want pluralism and 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 want a place near the wall where men and women can pray together no he he won't support that but he will back all of these christian zionists mm -hmm. Hagee at all um i don't know what we're going to do what what could we begin to imagine if some of these Christian nationalists get elected, God forbid, in November. Yeah. No, that's that 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 is a very um, unnerving notion because when you take the Jews will not replace us narrative from the Unite the Right rally and and all that went on there, and then five years, six years later, that becomes a political movement of people who are running for office at the state level and the federal level. Uh, that that is really dangerous. Um, People don't often know, and you've been really helpful for me, and so I think you will for some of the other listeners here, about the subtle ways that what we say and communicate has this anti-Semitic narrative to it. Oh, example here. Oh, we're running a press conference in New York on Friday, and a person came up to me, and she was opposed to our press conference. We had a big billboard that, you know, was talking about Michael Flynn and Eric Trump and their misuse of Christianity for their own purposes and so on. So she saw that, kind of listened to what we were doing before we started and came up to me and asked a bunch of questions like, are you, are you from here? Um, uh, you know, accused me of being one of those paid agitators. And she said, I, I, I know all this work that you guys are doing. You're all, and then she starts saying things that I don't think she knows that they come from an anti-Semitic narrative. They just it's not that obvious to her. It just creates the context of it. So she would say things like, well, I know you're paid by the funders of the democratic party. I know that you're in cahoots sure. with the media. And then I said, no, I wish we were paid by the democratic party. They don't actually help us at all. We, you know, we do all this. And I said, you know, in the media, look, there's not 
all that much media here. And she says, well, then you're probably paid by George Soros. She has no there idea who George Soros is. But Soros is a thing we're always accused of, meaning you're in partnership with the wealthy Jewish cabal, at, which also owns the media, which also owns and operates the Democratic Party. So when people say things like you can't trust the media and George Soros funds it, that's code language, right? And so my advice to people is don't let yourself go down that road. Um, like using those kinds of examples of what you think is the problem with the democratic system, that's, that's really problematic. First of all, do you think that that's right, that that's a right critique of the use of those terms? And what else should we be aware of that just sort of exist in our world? Like these little phrases, you, you know, we've talked here on the podcast, I think I've talked with you about it too. Growing up, I didn't know that little phrases that I would say uh, were connected to anti, you know, to, to racist thoughts or to anti-Semitism. I just had no idea, you know, f phrases that I know are offensive to people like saying, well, I just Jewed the person down on this thing. When I was a kid growing up here in, in, in Golden Valley, Minnesota, outside of Minneapolis, people said that all the time. And then as, when I l realized what it was, you know, you're like, oh my gosh, that is unbelievable. So I didn't know that it was, that's what the phrase meant. But it created a context so where you thought about Jewish people to, in that way. Let's go back to the origin of that. If you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, that is the only proper noun, a name, that is then made into a transitive verb with a lowercase. So to Jew someone, that's an actual verb. It's offensive. means to cheat yeah. and be cheap. Where does that come from? It comes from the name Judas, which is Greek for Jew. And who was Judas? He sold our Lord for 30 shekels. So it goes back to that fundamental story that keeps getting repeated mm. Sunday after Sunday. Of course, the Jews... Judas is linked to money. Soros is a billionaire. Zuckerberg, a billionaire. I mean, people who aren't Jews, but are billionaires, are put into this. It's an elite that is going to create the white genocide, the intentional mm. replacement of that woman you were speaking to in Rochester. Yeah. Her fear of being ignored is what feeds her inability to use language carefully. So if I showed her that, do you think I could convince her to stop saying George Soros? No, because the fear inside her of being ignored Mm -hmm. of not having made it and probably maybe not making it mm -hmm. has given her entree to this group of people with whom she can share an identity. Mm. We've not made it. They are trying to replace us, the undereducated white, mm -hmm. but the Lord is going to redeem us. Yeah, And if that means the guy in front is going to wear that funny shawl and blow that crazy ram's horn. I don't care, but I'm going to be saved. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly the narrative that we heard there. Um, so inside that, we've, we've mentioned a lot that inside the Christian world, there's diversity. So there's many kinds of Christians, right? There's progressives and conservatives and, and neo super conservatives and you know, super progressives. There's just all manner, right? And it's very easy for people to cast Christians or evangelicals or Catholics or whatever with the same brush. And I get it. It's nobody else's job to figure that out. Christians should articulate for themselves the, the diversity, and, and they do, and it's available. The same is true in the Jewish community. And this is part of what confuses people, right? They think the Republicans are pro-Israel, and some Jewish groups even come out and act pro-Israel. 
and you know we were going to talk about APAC here, uh, which is a big uh, political organizing group supporting all kinds of Republicans, and it makes people believe, well, then these people must be for Jews and for the rest of it, and so they don't understand why people marching are saying the Jews will not replace us and six million are not enough. They're like, that must not be these real Republicans because they're supported by groups like APAC or they're supporting Benjamin Netanyahu. And the, the Republicans invited the head of Israel to come to the United States. So therefore, of course, they can't be anti-Semitic. Can you talk about but that and the differences inside the communities, the Jewish communities in the U.S. as well? Can Jews have 11 opinions about what the Jew outside <laughs> should be doing? Um, there are very, very ultra, ultra orthodox, the black hatted Chabad Hasidim that Trump had at the White House all the time, uh, modern orthodox, conservative, reform, renewal, the unaffiliated, the secular. Uh, there have been no consistent leader, single all representative leader in the United States of the Jewish community ever, ever. Hmm. There are Jews from Central and Eastern European. Those are the Ashkenazi Jews, the hmm. Fiddler on the Roof Jew. There are the Western Mediterranean Jews, the Sephardic Jews. Those were the first Jews to come from Hasife, Brazil, from Spain, Portugal. Israelis are not the same as North American fiddler on the roof Jews. Hmm. Israelis are considered, if you're born in Israel, Sephardic Jews. They're Middle Eastern Jews. There are Jews that were forced out of all of North Africa, Egypt, Iraq, Iran, when Israel became a nation in 1948. Those hmm. Jews have nothing to do with the Eastern European Jews. So beyond the history of a Jewish pluralism is the fact that today, among the 15.8 million Jews in the world, most of those Jews are unaffiliated with the synagogue. Hmm. They wow. live their Jewish identity in an ethnic, intellectual, gastronomic way that has nothing to do with ritual practice. Hmm. So there are no, when, when I was the senior rabbi of Temple Israel in Minneapolis, uh, there, uh, this is the biggest reform congregation. There's another large conservative congregation. I could offer my opinion but the many people who belong to the synagogue would readily say that's his opinion, not our opinion. What a, okay? what, what, what a great okay. tradition that Christians should also take on. Okay, so Rabbi Marsha Zimmerman is the senior rabbi there now. She has an entirely different rabbinate than I had. She represents um, her generation both as a feminist as someone who has worked diligently in the multiracial community, that's different than uh, a rabbi who mm. is going to serve in Sioux City, South Dakota, mm. where there's a few hundred Jews, yeah. okay? Fargo, not even one synagogue left. There is no such thing as the Jewish community. Yeah. The Jews you saw in the White House with Trump are not now the Jews coming back to the Obama White House, similar to what the Obama White House was. Hmm. Look, pluralism is confusing. It's uh, messy. It's complex. But it's where we can learn the most from each other. Yeah. What? saddens me the most about Christian identity, Christian nationalism, the current stature of the Supreme Court is pluralism is being pushed aside. 
People can't have a dialogue because the extremes on the right and left don't allow for something in between. Joseph, has there ever been a Jewish Supreme Court justice? Oh, many, many. And there is right now. Kagan is Jewish. Okay, Kagan is Breyer Jewish. Breyer was Jewish. Oh, RBG Breyer was. was Jewish. Oh, of course, yeah. of course, of course, yeah. of course, of course. How come that's not talked about more often? I mean, am, or am uh, I just I missing think... it? You know, like I pay a lot of attention. I should have known RBG, of course. Um, but you don't hear the same way. Like, what, what is it in our society that we all know how Catholic the Supreme Court is? Uh, you know, it's a small little group. What, why is it not, um, why is the religious identity not a part of the, the political left or Supreme Court justices that are, that are nominated by the, by the left? Uh, I think Kagan and Breyer, who's recently retired, uh, never denied it. Uh, RGB, um, RBG um, talked about it a lot more because she became an icon in the Jewish community. Mm. Brandeis was first so-called Jewish Supreme Court justice. It depends on the social times. Wow. Mm -hmm. Is it of value that you know I happen to be a Jew? Hmm. I'm serving as an American jurist. Unfortunately, uh, the last two uh, white Supreme Court justices made it known <coughs> that their Catholicism was a yeah. basis for how they were jurists. I feel like that's super important. Like there's a different way that, re that different religious traditions in different times put forth the role of their faith in their, in the world. It's not all that long ago. I mean, my lifetime ago when Kennedy as a presidential candidate was about to break a social barrier by a Catholic becoming a nominee and then winning the, winning the presidency. And there were lots of Protestants who thought and still think the Catholics are the problem. It's a very confused religious world. That, that was a big crossing point and it was there was a movement that sort of said look your religion should be in one place and your politics as a as a public servant or, or somebody in any uh, position even the judiciary or anything should be another that was different than it is now it feels like there was some kind of a shift especially with catholics and evangelicals in public spaces to be much more forefront about that. Do you think some of that is what leads to this idea that one part of the political spectrum is religious and cares about religion and God and faith and the other side doesn't? Because that is a narrative that exists in a lot of the country on on both sides, right? You, you can stop an average person on the street and ask them, which which political party or political opinion do you think is more open to religion? And they'd be like, oh, for sure, Republicans, right? Like Democrats are hostile it, to religion. It is tragic that my grandchildren are growing up in an either or religious or secular world. I mean, there's nothing in between. Yeah. Yeah, it's really the, that's, that's really no, the crux. No, that's not what I want. I, I, I want a Doug Paget, Joseph Edelheit religion. I want a, a Michael O'Connell when he was the priest and rector of, you know, the Basilica of St. Mary. Uh, I want a religion that is anchored in values of community. Yeah. The, the problem with religion today is it's anchored in the certainty of theology. It's not anchored in the values of community. Hmm. What, what, what do you think? It's, yeah, I was going to ask that. Why is that? Why, why have we lost? It feels like pluralism is something that's not um, supported, cheered on, kind of by both sides of the political spectrum. They, yeah, they, absolutely there's... correct. Absolutely correct. So today we're talking about Christian nationalism and the problem of anti-Semitism. 
but we could be talking about what's going to happen uh, when the human being who attacked Salman Rushdie begins to explain whether he did it on the basis of a fatwa yeah. of radical, cruel Islam. Okay? Extremes on both sides. Dave Chappelle gets moved from First Ave to across the river next to the U because part of the community that supports First Ave is angry with the satire he uses. Okay, gee, that kind of strikes as a low threshold of what happened at Chautauqua. Yeah. It's the certainty on both sides. Uh, I've spent a lifetime, a career working on not being liberal, but on being yeah. inclusive and pluralistic. Yeah. Okay. Talk about the difference. Yeah. That's so you're onto something. It felt like it was a well-funded idea, at least for you and I over, you know, a decade and a half of relationship and for 25 years, last 25 years of my life, that the difference between being inclusive and pluralistic versus conservative or something like it's a, it's another way to be, it may end you up. And it has for me and a lot of my politics and supporting certain things, but it's also an approach to what do you do with the other? And that feels like a piece that's, that's really missing from our current conversations. So my teacher at the university of Chicago, David Tracy, uh, came to us and said, here, here are the things I want you to read that Voltaire wrote that helped frame the French Revolution. Okay. Oh, here are the things that I want you to read that Voltaire wrote that fueled the days of terror. What? Oh, yeah. Same guy wrote them both. Hmm. What was the difference in those modernity, writings? Modernity is anchored in radical ambiguity. If I'm going to be in a pluralistic, dialogical relationship, I have to find ways for my evangelical, Catholic, Pentecostal, Methodist, all of them. How do I relate to the differences that sustain my identity? Went to a Methodist minister many years ago, heard he, he was going to have Jesus at First Ave, at, at Hennepin Avenue. And I said, wait, wait, you can't do that. I will do Passover for your entire church. I'll invite you to temple, but you can't have Jews for Jesus. That's a limit beyond which I can go. Hmm. And we spent three days in dialogue. Hmm. And I helped them understand what that meant. Dialogue is not about pushing differences aside. Yes. It's about learning how to be present to differences. Okay, so and we we'll do it. we'll do an entire course on this because this is the thing that I think really lands for a lot of people is that there's a way of approaching interfaith in, and and interculture, interpolitical life. One is to say and I hear this a lot Let's not talk about the things that make us different. Let's talk about the things we share. Let's ha talk about our shared values. Okay, I'm all for that. I totally get that. We should talk about our shared values. And we should talk about the things that make us particular, unique, and diverse from one another so that we can know and understand and accept those. But that practice of hearing and listening to somebody else who's different and valuing them, even amongst disagreeing about things that are really important. Th that feels like the thing that pluralism that I thought the American experiment was about because it felt, I mean, I, who, look, who, whoever wants the melting pot, you know, it just conjures up an image of fondue, which is kind of a lovely, you know, late winter treat, but not a very good way to think about people. Like we're all blended, you know, we're all melted together and, and become indistinguishable. 
And then some people talk about a salad. A mixed salad is sort of a better way where they sort of sit next to each other. But I don't know. I want something that's not either of those food metaphors, something that is where people are different of views and ideas and understanding are impacting each other and are changing themselves because of their impact with someone who's different. That there's a true, as you called it, a dialogical relational experience that impacts you. I felt like that was hap I don't know, when I was sort of coming of age, I felt like that was the pursuit. And it seems to me that that's not the pursuit anymore. It or uh, it's not, not anymore. It's, it's, it's not, not as pursuit. in favor. We have given up the risks of dialogue. Huh. We're not interested in dialogue. We've moved from debate and dialogue, dialogue which provides you the possibility hmm. of discernment, wisdom. You don't win or lose a dialogue. <laughs> That's a great point. You don't. That's you don't debate. win or lose a dialogue. Yeah, fine, a but we've, we've now moved to a consistent diatribe. And the intention of diatribe is to discredit. Dialogue is to be present and learn, gee, what, what, what is it that defines you? Hmm. Not so I can change your mind, but I can learn about you so I can be present to you. No, we, we don't have time for that. So you can wear a T-shirt while you're involved in an insurrection that says six million are not enough. Camp Auschwitz, you can wave a flag, Jesus is our savior, Trump is our president, and think nothing of it. Hmm. So when I try to explain, excuse me, you're using my ritual objects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Jesus is my Lord, and you don't seem to understand that. No, I do understand it. You don't understand you're using my mm. ritual objects. Mm -hmm. So I don't know when we gave in to, but we're angry tribes. Yeah. Yeah. And the, it's, it's, it's really the conundrum of, I, I, and I hear people make the argument and I, I, if there's power to it, I know what they're saying that we live in such dangerous times, so much is at risk, we can't give a moment of comfort to the enemy. We can't, we don't have time for all of that. I, I, the, I posted a video of a conversation I had with somebody who attended the event and it was, we clearly disagreed, and it, but it was rather civilized and we actually both left it impacted by one another. And a person wrote something that I think captures, you know, one of the opinions of this, which is, I won't even watch this. I don't want to give any of my mind to the fact that these, that you th think that these people who believe all these horrible things are decent people that you could have a conversation with. You need to shut them down, shut them out and move on. That is, I mean, I'm an activist and I'm telling you in the activist spaces, that is what's most fuel than most people are interested in. And, you know, I, I don't tell people, you know, it's funny when you're a pluralist like this, you don't go around to those people and be like, well, you should stop doing that, right? You try to engage that. So I'm trying to listen really carefully and I understand the view that they're sharing that, look, this is not like we're disagreeing about, you know, uh, non-essentials. This is people's lives that are at risk here. And, you know, it goes to that real space when you're confronted with people saying, but this is about real life, this is about danger and threat, I feel like you have, you have a right to have a really good opinion about that. You're, you're not soft selling how pluralistic mutual dialogue is the solution to extremist dangerous thought. You're, you're not soft selling those, the, the, those uh, consequences. You're, you're taking them on directly. I have spent my entire career involved in what we're doing now, interfaith dialogue. And I've done it, and you've heard this story, 
when I was seven years old, I was called a Christ killer by the boy across the street who had just come home from catechism, holy name church. I didn't know Christ. I certainly hadn't killed him. But the problem was there were three of us on the block. I was seven years old. One guy had a ball, one guy had a bat, and one guy had a glove. Uh, the guy across the street had the ball. I've spent a career uh, attempting to learn what it is that people hate about Jews. Hmm. And they don't, they never hated Joe Edelheit, Joseph Edelheit. Yeah. They hated Jews. So if I can teach a course on anti Semitism, if I can do a podcast with Doug, I, it doesn't matter. There's a single boy out there who is not going to be rejected. Yeah. So you're, you're correct. We have to take the risks to get back into dialogue. Some of it will be wasted right now. Yeah. Some of it will be wasted. But there might be one or two people who talks to you and says, you know, he, he represents a Christianity I've never known. I've only known a Christianity of certainty. That guy seems to know about a Christianity in which questions are vital mm -hmm. in your faith. I, I want to talk to that guy some more. Maybe we live in a time where there are so many different sets of fears. Questions that lead to growth is not, not very high on the food chain right now. Yeah. Well, and this is, this is the hard thing, Joseph, right? Because you realize, look, there's people that hold Christian nationalist views and variety of things and they live in the united states there's a massive number of them and there's going to be representatives from that community who get elected to and are given the authority of political power in the united states we're going to have that and this is the heart this is the work i do i try to help faith voters not vote for people like that but there are going to be people like that who are represented in the United States government. So then the question becomes, what do we do about that? Because one option that a lot of people think is these folks need to be banned from everything. We need to make them unable to run. Like, I think we should work hard to make sure that less than 50% of the people in any voting population vote for them, for sure. I think that shouldn't happen. I don't want them to be elected. They're going to be, and they have been, uh, so they are in, in representative office now. And what do we do about that? How do we live in a world where even people who have views that we see as so harmful and dangerous have representation? That's what makes pluralistic society so difficult. Always. Uh, th there were those of us who said what you're saying when uh, Dr. King was assassinated when Medgar Evers was shot, uh, there were plenty of people who thought that civil rights should not take as many lives as it continues to take. Mm. It has transformed into a different, Black Lives Matter is not the civil rights movement that I participated in from my teenage years. <clears throat> We're going to have to find times to have more podcasts. Yeah. We're going to have to find times for you to continue your prophetic work in ways that regardless of who gets elected, yeah. we have to keep supporting the democratic process. We well, can't Joseph allow the fear to cripple what the two of us are doing. 
Yeah. And I know there's a lot of people who are going to hear more from you. You have other ways they can follow you, of course, you know, on the internet and all that stuff. You're a college professor. You've also written. Can you tell us about your uh, about your book and about this other piece yes. that you have coming out what on Rakur? What am I missing? Questions about being human. Uh, a book you and I have, have taught about and you were so good. a part of what developed my idea of six critical biblical characters each of whom is missing something and yeah. yet they are the absolute cornerstones of jewish and christian faith we're all missing something yeah and the the idea of that and of this conversation if people haven't picked it up already is the point of pluralism is because we come with a missing piece and that missing piece is over there do you remember when you were we, we did a, a an event at solomon's porch and you talked yeah. about this and we had people sit in different groups, and they had a puzzle, uh, like a, a 14 or 30-piece puzzle or something on each table. And I had taken some of the pieces from each puzzle and put them over on the other tables. So as they're putting their pieces together, their, their puzzles together, they realize, oh, we're missing some piece. And then it dawned on them, oh, it's over there at the other, at the other table. And it was My this little— My good friend Larry Kushner uses the metaphor— our lives are like a puzzle, but we open the puzzle to find out some pieces are missing and we have pieces that don't belong to our puzzle. <laughs> so what do we do with that? <laughs> yeah. And like that relationships are often about, ah, Doug is in my life because I have a puzzle he needs. Yes. I have a piece he needs. Well, that is um, like that. That is the approach that people will find in your book. What am I missing? So, if if they're interested in that idea, and how do we get there? And seeing that as you know, part of our the long tradition of spirituality and of humanity, because the way we've evolved as social creatures in our in our human experience is that there's actually interdependence even among those that we considered to be different or enemies or any of the rest of it, which is why for me, the Jesus teaching of you love God, of course, you love your neighbor and you love your enemy is the way that I access what Jewish communities have accessed for a very long time, those same, those same teachings. And so we, we treat as indispensable those who are different from us. And, and that is just such a hard thing ever to do, especially when people feel that they're, that they're endangered. But the reason that's so great hearing it from you is because you, as you started out, you, and you've done this every time we've talked, and it's important to put Judaism in the context of a people that have been attacked from the start of, you know, Western history. You know, you start with enslavement and an exodus, and you just run it right up until today. So when a rabbi in American context in 2022 says, I think pluralism is our answer to threat. That means something. And, and I, I so appreciate it. And I hope people will follow up with you on, on your book. Uh, and can you talk about this other, this other uh, project that you have coming where you're reflecting on the, on the, the thoughts of Rakur? Well, I'm, I'm working on a, an essay that a, a colleague uh, and I will represent at a major conference in Portugal uh in a couple months uh paul record my teacher from the divinity school wrote an essay in 1995 under the sponsorship of unesco out of this conference came the declaration of principles of tolerance and unesco's annual day of tolerance we love the word tolerance don't we well if you think about it it's actually a problematic term yeah. Would you like to tolerate what you witnessed in Rochester? Or yeah. did you just barely tolerate it? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're writing a book about what is intolerable today. Mm -hmm. And what do we do uh, with, yeah, how does a pluralist engage tolerance in the intolerable? Okay, so my teacher, Paul Ricoeur, suggests that a uh, pedophile might be something everybody could accept as intolerable. We were working on the essay at the time a 10-year-old rape victim had to move from Ohio to Indiana 
to have a doctor care for her because the rapist had impregnated her. And the state's leading legal representatives did not refer to the rapist as intolerable, but the doctor who cared for the 10-year-old rape victim. Yep. So uh, I guess pedophiles are no longer something everyone would consider as intolerable. And, and I, what does yeah. that mean? We've even lost that? A doctor who cared for a 10-year-old impregnated rape victim. Hmm. Yes, that is the villain in the story. Yep. Joseph, thank I, you, my friend. I thank, thank you for this conversation and for all your good friendship and great work. We'll be back together again soon. Doug, thank you for your prophetic work and be safe yeah. when you're doing the work for us. We'll, we'll do what we can. Safety first. All right, buddy. God thanks. Bless. All right. Hey, all. We'll, uh, we'll see you back here tomorrow. Thanks for being a part of the podcast and live stream.